To our participants from Europe, very good afternoon. To those from other parts of the globe, it may be a good evening or a good morning. I would like to welcome you to this session of the conference, The Terminal of Tomorrow, where we'll be looking at using lessons learned to prevent major incidents. My name is Mark Halewood, and I am going to chair this session and try and lead you through the discussions. I hold a Bachelor of Science in Applied Chemistry and a Master's Degree in European Health and Safety Law. I have almost 30 years experience in chemical process safety in which I advise and train employees of the state of Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany in the implementation of the Cervezo directives and the associated aspects of that. I'm also one of the vice chairs of the OECD Working Party on Chemical Accidents and have many years of experience working with intergovernmental organizations such as the European Commission or the UN Environment Programme. On the panel this afternoon, we have four experts from different aspects of safe operation of tank storage terminals within the process industries. We have Maureen Wood from the European Commission's Joint Research Centre, Nigel Cairns from the Aon Global Risk Consulting, Carl Daniels from Jessup, the Joint Emergency Service Interoperability Principles Team, and Thijs Kurz from the European Process Safety Centre. I'm going to start off by introducing each of our presenters. They will give a short presentation of their field of work, and then we'll move into the question and discussions. So, First up is Maureen Wood. Maureen is the sector head of the Major Accident Hazards Bureau of the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. In this role, she oversees the JRC's contribution of analysis and tools to support implementation of the Cervezo Directive and to promote capacity building in chemical accident prevention and preparedness programmes globally. In addition, she leads the EU scientific programme that focuses on accident analysis and collaborating with Cervezo authorities and international organizations to exchange lessons learned and good practice for risk management. Previously, she worked for the US Chemical Safety Board and the American Chemistry Council in the area of process safety. Personally, I've worked with Maureen very closely for a period of about 15, 16, 17 years now. And I know that in, we both share a passion for learning from accidents understanding the risks involved. So Maureen, the floor is yours. Your presentation, please. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for that really nice introduction. And uh, um, I hope that I can give a little bit of flavor to our panel on that shared passion. Um, I took the opportunity to take a look at first some accidents that have happened recently. Um, and oh, am I supposed to be able? Sorry, guys, I thought I was supposed to be able oh I see to move this okay it's moving now sorry I'm a impatient with technology everyone knows this so let's just start with some recent headlines that were in the last three months showed up um, and uh, I monitor the media almost every day for accidents and we regularly see storage uh, issues and not surprisingly um, we see a lot of unloading and loading accidents as you might have seen, there's one there, odor nuisance in Antwerp. I think that happened a couple of weeks ago. That happened due to loading and unloading. Another amazingly often, uh, I think it's amazing because we know this is an issue, um, but we do see a lot of wrong mixtures. The wrong thing, the wrong substance was added to the tank. Um, we often see also the one at the top, um, an uncontrolled, uh, loading and not loading into a tanker meaning that there were no automated controls and there was a leak and they didn't know it and it fell and instead of going into the tanker uh it went on for hours this one i think went on for about two hours and um and ended up not going into the tanker but into the port that's happened more than once um many times probably a year um evacuation of a um uh, a factory because of a nitric acid release. Um, 
and this one I think was because of a leak or a mechanical, mechanical integrity issue. I think you recognize all these accidents. What I thought I would do, uh, well, what I have done, is take a look at what we've had in our EMARS database. This is the EU's accident reporting system. It's an obligation of the European uh, save -as -as sites, the high hazard, um, excuse me, the authorities to report what we call major accidents, which have uh, a certain threshold that's listed in the save -as -as directive, um, and they have to report them to uh, the European Commission. These are not just major accidents. Many of our countries, and thanks to you operators, also report near misses. So these are a mix of near misses and major accidents. And what I did was I tried to find those that were obviously tank storage and had enough information that I could do a little analysis for this um, present for this panel. And so what I found were 21. And it's not a huge number, but it's very interesting because a few things stand out. I think the one that stands out most is loading and unloading. And I can tell you that also I track this in when I when I uh, monitor incidents in the media and when they have um, the process um, where in which it took place, where the conditions I mark it, I, I put it in a database, and I notice that we have a lot of loading and unloading also coming through in the database when it's reported in the media. And of course, you'll see a uh, maintenance, and then also one during startup. And then no activity means nothing was happening, and then suddenly uh, they discovered there was a leak or or there was a natural hazard that hit the tank or something like that. Um, so um, then I looked at what was the immediate cause of the release. Um, in six cases, it was uh, something was left open and it shouldn't been. And this also points to underlying causes. In every one of those cases, that would have been to the uh, a wrong procedure or or no or not enough training according to the report. Then we also had a, a leak or an overpressure that happened. Um, Damage to a part during ap operation, three of them. Corrosion, three of them. Hot work, we have often, we have, this is a lower percentage of hot work than usually I see. Hot work is probably this uh, one of our highest causes of accidents in, in tanks and other equipment. Um, and then a purging error and a wrong mixture. So those are kind of what I found. Again, it's only a sample of 21, but it does show an array of accidents that I think that you all recognize. This was what I thought was really kind of interesting. Even with um, only 21 accidents, we had an overwhelming amount of uh, underlying causes pointing to the lack of training and proper procedures. Um, no, no, the documentation was missing. There was absolutely no historical knowledge. I mean, there was one which was uh, similar to that one in San Francisco port recently in which uh, apparently they didn't even know that they had a pipe attached to the loading dock and it happened to be open because a change they made. All the things that went wrong were pretty, um, uh, were, were um, multiple and were underlying causes showing a, a very poor understanding of the site. And also I would note that it was a great great report that they documented all that. Um, so, and we are getting some good reports in. And then we have, um, I, um, so that's a question, question I really have is, maybe that is something that should be focused on more is this knowledge management because it seems to be a big causal, part of causality. Um, there's also risk assessment failures. So there, there should have been barriers. Um, there should have been some kind of uh, sort of bow tie analysis that would have foreseen. But of course, that goes sometimes with the procedures. If you didn't train someone and didn't have the foresight to do that, then you may not have had the foresight also to put up a barrier if the procedure was wrong. And then, of course, we've had some design and installation issues and maintenance. Um, so my comments on these are um, what I already observed is in the first bullet, which is that lots of knowledge management issues and to some extent also risk assessment. Um, loading and loading, as I noted, is particularly correlated with poor training and wrong procedures. Um, risk assessment failures uh, are usually sorted with um, the inspection frequency or choices in maintenance, including a choice not to maintain it properly or to put in some repair that wasn't sufficient, it was clearly not sufficient, um, and of course the lack of barriers. Um, 
Also, the possibility for failure associated uh, with equipment design and inst installation seem to be underestimated in some cases, um, sort of an afterthought about in, in terms of when it was chosen. It wasn't exactly the right fit for the, for the particular situation for the particular um, situation. In some case, in one case, I remember that I looked at where they had a lot of information. They thought the tank design was completely wrong for its use. And then, and, and the recommendation was that the operator, the design, the, the, the engineering firm that designed the tank and um, other, um, other uh, managers in the process needed to get together before they commissioned that tank design and decide exactly what it was for because it, obviously they hadn't done it before it got into service. That was the comment. We're getting good lessons learned, as you can see. But on, on the other hand, we sometimes have pretty poor lessons learned. And remember, we're getting reports that are filtered through inspectors. And um, so we're not sure exactly what was produced, uh, whether that was the inspector's report or the industry's report. But certainly, there's about um, 40, 30 to 40 percent of the reports are fairly limited and and uh, focus on the technical failure or the remediation, but not in the lessons learning. For most of the wrong procedures, I wasn't clear at all why they hadn't trained their people and why they didn't have the right procedures. I don't think any one of those ex explained that. They tell you that the lesson learned is training, but you think, well, didn't you know that? before so you know these are kind of the questions is maybe what what goes on that 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 happens a lot that there's not proper training um is that, that may be a very temporary job for a lot of people I, I really don't know but it's something you can analyze is that a problem in your site um and then uh, also we get sometimes stories that don't even make sense and i don't know if that was the fault of the inspector or the report itself but sometimes we get a long story of what happened and then um, the cause was that the pressure valve didn't work right, and you sit there and think, I think there were a lot of other things going on there. So, um, so that's just the problem with the reports. And then if the reports aren't written well, um, then perhaps the lessons aren't learned very well, and then the lessons aren't also that interesting. Um, the pipe needs to be fixed is not exactly something that anybody would remember and take home with them. Um, so there's questions about making reporting and meaningful so that the universal message and the larger picture is shared with those who need to know it. So I think that's where I'll end. There's a lot more questions around lessons learning that you could talk about in this context, but I hope I've raised uh, some of them. So. Thank you very much, Maureen. Hopefully that has stimulated some of the listeners and participants to already start thinking about questions they might like to ask. Um, before I introduce Nigel, I would like to in, um, draw your attention to the, the panel on the right of your screen, which allows you to ask questions to the panel and also the links to the polls. The panel members have pose questions for the participants to think about what goes on on their site and how well do they really learn. Now to move on to our second speaker, to Nigel Cairns. Nigel works for Aon Global Risk Consulting based in London and is a chartered chemical engineer and a fellow of the Institution of Chemical Engineers. He is also registered as a professional process safety engineer. Before he joined the insurance industry, he gained 18 years experience in various uh, petrochemical and uh, facilities, various points around the world. But in, in 2010, he moved into risk engineering, carrying out insurance underwriting service, surveys of refining petrochemical fertilizer assets. And he has managed key global accounts across upstream, downstream sectors, helping clients to identify risk exposures and developing pragmatic risk-based management solutions to improve risk profile. Nigel was also awarded the Insurance Industry's 2019 Tom Redman Trophy for his significant contribution to risk reduction within the oil, gas, petrochemical, and en energy industries. In I'd like to hand over to you, Nigel. Tell us a little bit about 
how we can learn from what the, ins the insurance industry has already learned about our facilities. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, very short introductory uh, presentation for myself. So good afternoon, as, as Mark has said. I'm Nigel Cairns from Aon Global Risk Consulting based in London. I'm a senior engineer within the energy risk engineering team. And uh, as Mark said, also a, a professional process safety engineer. I have a background uh, in the petrochemicals industry, uh, moved in, into insurance in 2010. Uh, as, as Mark said, since then, much of my work has been uh, conducting risk engineering surveys at client sites, trying to share good practice, trying to help sites reduce the chance of, of having a loss. Uh, though, of course, unfortunately, um, sites of all types around the world have continued to have losses, as we've already talked about. You know, Maureen's already, already mentioned that. Um, so, for example, between 2016 and 2020, the downstream energy underwriters in the insurance industry paid out for three and a quarter billion dollars worth of losses over and above the income that they got from premiums. So I thought really for my opening salvo, I would I would put up this slide here uh, to try and keep at the back of our minds perhaps during the coming discussion, hopefully prompt a few questions uh, with two uh, very pertinent quotes. Uh, one from the, the gospel according to Trevor Kletz and the other from the Old Testament. So uh, I think it's worth having a, a quick look at those Keep in the back of your mind because I think uh, it's a theme that will come up uh, during the, the next hour or so of our discussions. So that's all for me from now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nigel. And that was a brief um, introduction. And, but I think the insurance industry's view will interest a lot of people because they pay a lot of money in insurance premiums. But they also hope to get money back um, when it goes wrong. So, um, yes, let's move on to our third speaker. Our third speaker comes from a group of people that most people don't actually ever want to meet them in the emergency services. Um, they never really want to see you, Carl, on the day when it, it's all gone wrong. And however, I think you're likely to want to explain to us, actually, you'd like to talk to site operators much more deeply and a lot earlier than when the tank's on fire and you're standing there with blue lights trying to work out how long this is going to go on for. Carl leads the United Kingdom Joint Emergency Service Interoperability Principals Team as the Deputy Senior Responsible Officer. He has been recognised, in fact, by the Queen in the Birthday Honours List for Services to Incident Response and was awarded an MBE. He has over a decade of experience in multi-agency and cross-government work at national level. Carl has significant knowledge and understanding of how these agencies need to work together to deliver their service to design emergency preparedness and response plans. He originates from the ambulance sector but has experience at all levels of command from operational through to strategic. He attained a master's degree with merit in management from Manchester Metropolitan University Business School in 2009. Carl, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Mark. I always uh, hope that I can live up to the billing that uh, goes before. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so um, I'd like to talk to you um, in my introduction a little bit about uh, preventing incidents by learning from the past. Um, and it was really interesting, the lead in from Nigel's final two quotes on his slides there uh, really resonate with me in terms of the um, things that I'm going to talk about. Um, and lessons learned is a very interesting term in itself um, because what we've actually done in the UK is we, in certainly what my team do, is we break it down into the lesson identified and then the journey begins of how we had to get it to a lesson learned. And there's some of the things that hopefully will uh, come out in this presentation that I'm going to give now, a very short presentation I might add. Um, so the Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Team came together in 2012 and we were brought together by the then Home Secretary, Theresa May who wanted to understand why the emergency services were having recurring issues at incidents or failures, if you like, for want of a better term. Um, so we brought together a multi-agency team 
which is a team that I lead, to try and understand what these issues were. Um, but we also didn't want to just base this on our opinions of what we think, because in the emergency services, anybody that puts a uniform on are generally very opinionated people. Uh, we wanted to try and put some science behind it and understand some of the facts. Um, but really, our overall aim is about working together, saving lives. We try to adopt this um, ethos of teams of teams. So we understand that police, fire, ambulance, coast guard, military, all responders are all different teams of people. But it's a case of how do we bring those together in one team on the day of an emergency so that we can work seamlessly together. And we define interoperability, which is what we're trying to achieve, as the way that organisations can work together coherently as a matter of routine. So I'll just show you some of the things that we we do for that. Um, so first of all, believe it or not, there was no joint doctrine. There was nothing that set down how do we actually work together. Um, so we all have individual uh, doctrine, but nothing that said how we bring our skills and assets together. Um, so our doctrine is a very small document, 32 pages. It's currently just under review. And in there are common models and principles that all the emergency services agree to adopt from uh, the principles themselves of co-locate, communicate, coordinate, jointly understand risk and shared situational awareness. They're the principles we aim to achieve through the use of a shared situational awareness model and a joint decision model. The joint decision model, when we started in 2012, we had five different models across, across three different services. So that was kind of the issues that we were facing. So now it's trying to get people to use one model. And what we do is we support services by providing things like e-learning, mobile applications, which are free to download. In fact, anybody who's in the audience today can download this uh, just by going to the app store. Um, and we also provide um, advice and support to services uh, verbally and physically by going and visiting them and seeing how they're, um, how they're actually embedding Jessup. But I mentioned about how we, how did we come up with those models? We wanted to base it on a little bit of science if we could, uh, rather than just opinions. Um, so what we had to do was look back to move forward really. Um, and with that, what we did was we commissioned um, Dr. Kevin Pollock who was uh, working for our emergency planning college in the UK. And we asked him to look at 32 major incidents from 1986 to 2010. And the way we chose these major incidents was the fact that they'd all been subject to a public inquiry. So therefore we knew that if there'd been a public inquiry, there was gonna be a substantial report that listed what all the common failures or, or what all the failures were for that particular incident. And we asked him to come up with what the common themes were. What were the issues that people were facing when working together. And generally they fell into a, into five or six different areas. Um, training was either inadequate or not coordinated, so we didn't train together very often. Um, we didn't generally understand each other because we used technical language that wasn't uh, common across all the agencies. Um, we also didn't um, understand risks appropriately in terms of one service would look at a risk in a different way. We wouldn't share information. Um, is certainly in a timely manner or in a way that it could be used by other services. Um, and the other thing was, it was about lessons learned. So that term again, what we found was that we have all these massive reports that come from these inquiries, uh, some of them run into several volumes, uh, and some of them that you can probably relate to, such as Bunsfield, Piper Alpha, things like that. Um, but we had no system of auditing how would those lessons being received and embedded within organizations. So what we did was we came up with um, a system called Joint Organizational Learning Online, which sits on the, the UK Government Secure website, um, Resilience Direct, and all services can access that and share their lessons on there. And then what my team will do is my team will moderate those lessons, we will analyze them and risk assess them. And if we feel that there is need for national action we can issue what's called an action note. And basically that will go to every chief officer saying exactly what they should do. Um, and then they have to report back their progress on that to say that they've undertaken the actions we've asked of them. So we now have a central database of how people are responding to these reports. Um, obviously before this, one of the key things, and it was really interesting listening to Maureen, it was almost like she'd seen the next slide I was gonna put up. Um, it was really good that the, the key thing that Maureen pulled out um, seemed to be at the top was training. Um, we have a couple of issues going on at the moment. We have um, the uh, Grenfell Tower fire, 
which is currently in its phase two um, public inquiry. And we have the Manchester Arena attack, which is currently ongoing um, in terms of its public inquiry. And these are likely to show some uh, failings in terms of the way the emergency services responded. And I, I don't know what the outcomes are going to be exactly yet, but I would not be surprised if they point back to training. Um, and not necessarily the quality of training, but probably more, more often than not, the frequency. Um, so it's not good enough to just train somebody once in a crisis management role and then expect five years down the line when that crisis actually arrives that they'll remember what to do or they will pull out a little piece of paper that you've given them on a training course with a few actions on. Your response will not be appropriate. It will not stand up. Um, so I just pulled up these are from various different incidents that I managed to find going through some reports. And the word training comes up nearly every report training is an issue. Um, and one of the key things to remember is, and I think one of the ones I, I, I look back to was Piper Alpha, that a lot of people who were working on the day doing a normal job on the rig actually had a crisis management role that they may have been trained for many years ago, but it had never been tested, never been refreshed. So when the crisis happened, their actions were ineffective because they just they were overwhelmed. They couldn't remember what to do. So I just want to leave you with that, really, and just understand that the, the, the position of training in all of this. Um, and obviously, there, there are many other facets, but the training, we have to train people and regularly. Um, that's it for me. I just wanted to leave you with that thought of joint organisational learning online about having a central portal where we can bring all these lessons to and share them. Thank you very much, Carl. In that's very stimulating thoughts for the future discussions. In training, I think is going to be one of the the key issues that we we need to talk about, um, and we'll come back to that later. Finally, I would like to introduce our um, fourth speaker on the panel, Tice Kurtz. And Tice um, is based in the Netherlands. He studied chemistry at the Utrecht University and obtained a PhD at the Eindhoven University of Technology. He got his process safety experience at a wide range of um, large chemical companies, including DuPont, G Plastic, and Lionel Bazel Industries, working with a wide range of hazardous processes in technical, operational, and business roles. He is the operations director for the European Process Safety Center. Um, European Process Safety Center was set up as a result of a major release from a tank in India as a follow following on from Bhopal and I've had connections with the European Process Safety Center for a long long time and I've known Thais personally also for a, a number of years. He is a passionate coach, a trainer and a speaker and again training is an issue and I'd like to hand over to you Thais. Tell us what we need to learn and what EPC can contribute to. Yeah, thank you. Mark, thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, that, uh, that, that, that is excellent. Um, and can you bring me to the next slide or will I do that myself? Yeah. That's that's excellent. Yeah, as um, as, as as said, um, most of my time I uh, I play as um, as coordinating the activities of the uh, European Process Safety Center (EPSC), which provides an um, a network towards the industry of um, of working together on um, on, on process safety. Um, as mentioned, it, it, it was established after the large tragedy uh, that, that happened in, um, in Bhopal in the, um, in the 80s. And um, that, that was a shock to society. Um, and, and the industry, of, of, of course, it was very bad for the people in Bhopal. Um, in, in the end of the day, it was also uh, bad for the company that caused it, Union Carbide, because they, they ceased to exist after that, that single incident. And, uh, but it was also not good for the reputation of the chemical industry. And they decided uh, to take on their obligation to, to better protect society against the uh, negative aspects of, um, of, of hazardous chemicals. 
that we often bring together in large quantities on, um, on operational sites. So um, it, it, it is basically about a, a legit, legitimate network. So we are able to talk to each other um, and, 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 and help each other and, and, and know each other, see each other. Um, and, and eventually, the, the main thing that we focus on is, is just industrial best practices. And, and I know best practices is, um, is a word that has been used uh, uh, very, very much, very, very often, and maybe devaluated in value. But, but still, um, it is essential what you do, that you do that world class, um, and that you know what your, um, what your partners are, are, are doing, what the other companies are doing, um, benchmark yourself versus um, what they do. So you feel confident that, uh, that what you do is really the, um, the, the best way to operate your, um, your facilities. Um, and, and, and I guess that's, that's a little bit um, about what, what can I say more. We have, um, we have two, two, two big meetings a year, a spring and a fall technical meeting. We have some working groups that are, um, that are supporting this. We have um, plenty of webinars and um, we have about 50 members um, that have operational sites in the uh, EMEA region. So that the time zone and the culture is, um, is, is, is pretty much aligned and, um, and getting connected is easy. Let, let's see what's on the next slide. Uh, there's there's one initiative that, um, that that I really like to, um, to to share with you, which is the, which is about learning of of incidents, and uh, you, you can do that on, on many many ways. Um, but but one thing that is uh, that we have observed is that uh, incidents can repeat. Whether this is an overflow of a tank with. Um, uh, whether this is uh, ammonium nitrate which get ignited by a fire. Um, this, this uh, things, things repeat. So, so we need to do a better job in, in learning from, from our incidents. Um, and, and here, the way, the way to do that is each month we just take a typical incident that, uh, that happened in the industry um, where I feel you can, you can learn a lot. And we describe just in two sentences um, what happened because um, it, it, it's not, not, not worthwhile to say how, how many people died and, 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 and what the cost is related. So we will not, 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 not focus uh, generally on that, um, but, but, but just very short what happened. And then the key things is, of course, what are the good practices that you need to bring in place uh, to avoid things like this? And that's where you need to have a, a big intense discussion um, on your operational side with uh, between your operations managers, your shift leaders, and and, and feel free to involve your um, <coughs> your, your operators and, and the maintenance people. Um, and and here there are just a handful of of bullets, very shortly um, that that trigger that discussion and say, hey, do we understand that? Um, um, is, is is that helpful or not? Um, this, this was a very sad incident um, because it had it had several fatalities in um, in India, which is about uh, the storage of um, the chemical called styrene. Many call it S S M styrene monomer because uh, it's used to have um, to make polystyrene. <clears throat> and due to Corona, this plant um, stopped producing and um, then stored uh, a bit of their monomers in, um, in in two tanks on this um, on this location. And you see um, one of these tanks uh, um, on on the right. That, that has this uh, styrene monomer in there. And, and most of you which had a little bit feeling of chemicals, when you look to this, uh, this molecule on the right side, you see a double bond. And a double bond means it can undergo a radical polymerization. And that means it can start being uh, polymerizing at, at, at very low temperature. So at room temperature, and when you have a single radical in, in that storage tank, which is uh, hard to avoid, uh, you, you always have, have uh, some radicals. And then uh, these radicals start to, um, to, to initiate a polymerization reaction. Um, that, that by itself might not be uh, um, that bad, uh, having, having uh, extreme small, uh, small dimers or, or, uh, or 
polymerization chains. But um, that reaction is exothermic, so uh, it, it creates heat. And basically, it uh, it means that within that storage tank, you have a, you have a heat generation. And um, and as, as as you know, uh, um, if if the temperature increases, this this reaction goes uh, goes faster. And that's the principle of uh, a runaway reaction that you're having when you um, when you store which you can have when you store reactive chemicals. And that's exactly what uh, what happened here. Um, they 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 stored the um, the, the styrene monomer, the, the, the polarization started, um, the, the heat started, and then the, the, the reaction uh, went faster and, and more heat was, was generated. Um, what you see on the tank is, um, is, is, is white smoke, and, and, and the white smoke is because uh, the temperature increased so high that uh, the styrene started to evaporate and, and started to exit from uh, from the tank. Luckily, the tank did not explode. Uh, there's there's good pressure control on these systems, but um, the styrene monomer gets gets out of the tank. And 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 here the thing, uh, besides uh, being being reactive, uh, the styrene is not uh, styrene monomer is not a nice chemical. It's 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 toxic. And as of a thousand ppm, um, uh, it can, it can start. Uh, as of here, it says as of five thousand ppm, it, it can uh, can start to kill people, and that that sounds like a, a, a low con concentration, but um, but 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 it, it, it's uh, that 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 is a low concentration because it's still expressed in ppm, and and uh, it's it's lower than a percentage. Um, so that cloud spread over um, over people um, over an area where people were living, and uh, people inhaled that, that that toxic material, and um, and that's what when uh, when fatalities uh, uh, started. <clears throat> and and here the thing is, of course, uh, when you store a chemical, uh, understand its reactivity. That's that's the key the key thing. And then you you need to understand a little bit how do you control that uh, that reactivity. Now here here uh, the, the typical case is it started with radical radicals so you need to have stabilizers in there uh, which kills your your radicals and and, and and make sure they do not start the, uh, the polymerization so um so that helps uh, strongly there's oxygen concentration which uh, which is relevant that uh, that you need to understand and um, and of course temperature control uh, if you see your temperature uh, uh, goes uh, goes up then uh, um, you need cooling you need you need to have strong interlocks and finally if there's really nothing you can do you see this um, this this coming slowly and slowly then uh, you still have the, the the opportunity to inform your inhabitants and uh, have people on site you can you can start your emergency response and and also off site um, so, so with a simple sheet, um, each month we we stimulate people really to uh, to learn from a, a typical incident, and uh, all the new people uh, need to understand and, and and discuss this, and understand the critical aspects that they have at their site. Uh, so, how do they control their uh, inhibitor concentration? How do they control their temperature? What kind of things are there? Is this a sill interlock? What is the sill level? Um, make sure it's never bypassed. So, these these things are are, are really relevant. Um, we translate these um, these these learning sheets now in, um, in 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 over a dozen languages. Uh, I think we are at fifteen. The, the, the last languages were Chinese and uh, Arab, um, but but feel free to, um, to to get connected here if you um, if you click on the EPC uh, website and you click on the um, um, learning sheets, you can uh, hit the button subscribe and then each month you get these um, these things sent to you, um, and, and and they are nice learning opportunities for um, a broad a broad range. Um, and I like to mention you one, one more initiative, and um, yeah, please, please get me connected to the last slide um, that, that I have. This, this is yeah. Oh, sorry, no, no, no. The, the, the one, one, one back. Yeah, yeah, one back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This, this is an initiative that um, I, I also like to mention because um, it was started after a, a big, a big incident in the Netherlands uh, where we had an explosion in um, in a distillation tower. And um, that, that company said, uh, we need to do a better job on process safety. I wanted to see that we establish process safety uh, 
uh, excellence. So process safety excellence. And then he, he starts, they start thinking on, on how to define that. Um, people uh, approach, approach hazardous chemicals by having a management system. But the management system is quite high level. Eh? If, if you say you, you always need to understand your risks, um, et, et, et cetera, that's still still quite quite high level. Um, what we see is that the, the incidents typically happen eh, because um, the, 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 the incident with chemicals, eh, where with chemical releases, typically happen in, in, in the same kind of, uh, of situations. Eh? For example, you have a plug, and if you remove the plug, that uh, if you have a plug line, you, you, you are in big trouble. And, and if you get, get creative to, to remove that plug, then uh, this is typically a very good starting to point to have um, a, a chemical release. And, um, and that's, that's something that, um, that, that, that you need to realize. So this is a one step lower to, to, to operations. And what we defined is we defined some uh, uh, process safety fundamentals. And that is just a, a pictogram. And if, if you see these pictograms, then um, you, you, you say, yeah, that's typically what we have. For example, the, the, the first one is double isolation. Uh, people understand that if you if you just have your drain valve, then after the drain valve, you uh, you need to have a second a second thing that closes, which can be a blind flange, which can be an end cap conform pipe spec. Um, but, but but you need to have that. Still, if you walk on a chemical site. Uh, if you walk around, it's very easy to find the locations where they don't have that. And I'll tell you the uh, the, the refineries that I've worked on, where we we, we got got a hundred ton crude um, um, on a, on a night with uh, with a lot of um, lightning, so it could have been ignited very very easily. And then uh, in a tank farm, so we would have been very very close to um, to our Bunsfield incident here in the Netherlands, uh, just because we we didn't have that second layer um, at in. Uh, being, being placed back after um, after operational after maintenance work. So in practice, um, there's lots of opportunities to to not do this right, and there, there there are many practical problems. And you really need to understand these practical problems. Why are things not going as as, as we wanna 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 have? It? Uh, for example, you see an operator and you say, hey, um, a drain you never leave alone. Everybody knows that. Um, uh, you drain the water, and as soon as the oil is getting out, you close the drain valve. Um, but, but if that draining process costs you 14 hours, uh, do not expect your operator to stand there. Uh, so, so understand the practical things, um, uh, how things go in practice before, before you establish the easy rules. And then, um, and then what we did is at each of these um, areas with, with high likelihoods of, of things going wrong, um, we mentioned a number of things to get it right. So this is what we call the options to, to get it right. Now, I understand that sounds pretty soft eh, because um, the golden rules eh, which are typically for to protect lives of people eh, like like buggle up when you drive and uh, if you work at height then uh, eh, you are aligned um, these these are pretty straightforward simple rules that um, that you can say hey you either do it or you don't work with us i'll tell you here it, it's a little bit more complicated um, because uh, you can say we, we, we never work after uh, uh, behind a single valve. That's that's a, a thing. We never work behind a single valve. You know, we can you can say that rule, but um, but but not all plants are fully lined out with double block and bleed. So so you need to be creative. What are you going to do if you uh, if if you do maintenance work on a pump? And I'll tell you, people say yeah, we, we have we have locked the pump very well. We apply Lodo, and, and and that's 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 why we have put our blind plates. But I'll tell you, nine out of ten of the blind plates we install in the industry is uh, we do actually work behind a single valve. So if that single valve by accident opens, you, 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 have, a, you have a very serious incident. And uh, that's the one on, on, on the bottom right where we say never work behind a single valve. Um, actually, we in industry work, work, work many, many times behind a single valve. And if you don't realize that, and if you don't take the right precautions to do that, uh, you create you create very very serious um, serious incidents. Um, these process safety fundamentals are available for everybody in a, in a simple booklet. Um, if you if you go to the website of the EPC, you can um, yeah you can you, you you can show that, and um, we're also making them available in in several languages. Um, thank you for the short introduction and um, um, allowing me to mention these um, initiatives. 
Thank you very much, Thais, for that presentation. And there are questions in the, the chat on the side of your screen. And we'll come, come back to the, uh, them at various points. Um, however, I'd like to start with a, a question to Nigel. In, insurance is something that interests people. It costs them money. Um, <laughs> And money is in it, it focuses um, thinking. So, can you actually save money by investing in preventing accidents? What is the insurance uh, business view on this? Let me um, start by answering a slightly different question, which is about determining premium levels, and then I'll and then I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Storage terminals are typically considered as part of um, downstream or midstream operations by insurance companies. Uh, so premium levels for insuring terminals against property damage or business interruption loss will be determined using the same principles as other downstream occupancies, such as refineries and petrochemical plants, etc. Now, it would be nice to think um, that premiums, you know, depending on how much you have to um, sort of pay, are determined solely by risk quality i.e. You know, a site that has, has had no losses in recent memory or has completed all of its um, insurance risk engineering recommendations would have a considerably lower premium year on year compared to a site that has had regular losses and made little progress with recommendations, you know, i.e. you get credit for um, putting in good engineering practices. Unfortunately, it's rarely the case because um, although things like lost record or um, you know, measures that you've taken uh, to reduce risk exposures do have an impact. By far, the biggest definer of premium levels is actually the availability of capital to insurers. So post-financial crisis of 2008, money poured into the insurance uh, area uh, from investors who took money out of banking. So all this extra cash resulted in almost a decade of falling premiums across the downstream sector, almost independent of, of risk quality. And this is known as a soft market. So this was only reversed, really, when we started seeing a glut of losses around 2017, 2018. And this resulted in insurers then raising premiums to recoup those losses. So under these conditions, as we find ourselves now, generally having a good loss record has meant that premium rises have not typically been as high as for sites with a poor loss record. Um, so sites have been getting credit for making good um, for installing recommendations and putting in you know, good practices. The direction, however, in in the in the premium um, for both the kind of better quality risks and lower quality risks has, has still been upwards. And in comparison, the upstream and offshore areas have seen far fewer losses year on year, so their premiums have remained more steady than the sort of up and down in the uh, in the downstream and midstream areas. So we'd like to say, um, if you do, do your recommendations, have fewer losses, your insurance premiums would be lower. Um, but unfortunately, that tends to be this kind of minor contributor towards what determines your premiums. If that answers the question. Thank you. In... Maureen, you said you analyse a lot of data. Do you just look at the European data or where does your data come from all over the world? You're on mute. Um, all over the world, but that doesn't mean that it's uh, from a lot of places because there are actually uh, very few open sources that have uh, lessons learning for chemical accidents online. There's just a handful. Um, maybe six I can name off the top of my head and uh, and sometimes then you can also use some scientific literature to, 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 to back that up but we use them all and we generally and then we also uh, do so, um, a mo monitoring of the media and we try to get a basic understanding of the characteristics of the accidents from media reports and this is because of the absence of a lot of data globally. It's a way to understand what's happening globally, what kind of accidents are happening, what industries, where they're happening. Uh, now we're even looking at uh, see if there's any causality, even if reports from the media might not be that reliable. 
sometimes they are they, sometimes they do can't contain details that you can count on and so we do both so we do we use our, our we use the in-depth reports from wherever we can get them including our own database to do uh, to do a specialized topic um, analyses like the one I just did on tanks and uh, and then we use the global database to sort of give us a bigger picture and that's that's kind of how, how our main practice here. Carl, thank you very much Maureen. Carl, you've talked about training and is very important in and particularly for, for Jessup in to get the different branches of the emergency responders to coordinate and work together. How does this integrate with the site operators? In is do you have a strategy for how the on-site planning coordinates with the off-site planning? And what would your recommendations be on how to make that work? So we have, um, obviously, every country has regulators that say what they should and shouldn't do in terms of on-site and off-site plans. Um, and people will often feel that they've done enough just to satisfy the regulator, uh, potentially. Um, but what we find is, um, it's about bringing the expertise together um, on a more frequent basis. So, for example, if you have a requirement to um, run a test on, a, on um, a plan every 12 months, actually, why can't we expand that out to whenever we're running a test on a piece of equipment that might be more frequent than that? Why can't we invite off-site responders in um, and have them see what we actually do? Because as site operator, you are the expert. The, the people coming in in times of a crisis are not the experts. Yes, they can fight fires and mitigate risks like that, but actually you are the expert of that site. You you know what's on there. You know how those um, substances behave. So the more frequently we work together, the better we will be on the day of an incident. Um, so it's not just about, as I say, satisfying your regulatory obligations. It's about looking for every little opportunity where you can improve knowledge and working together um practices and, and just exploit those opportunities as much as possible thank you very much so again so expand your jessup network to involve the operators as well and from both sides talk to each other yeah absolutely and it, sorry and if i may just add on to that as well uh, i talked about joint organizational learning we actually had a fatality on a um, on a tank farm um and what we found was there was a little bit of rub between the services coming in and the site operator where the site operator almost wanted to take a step back and leave it with the emergency services but the emergency services were very much of the opinion well no this is your site you know this site better than us so it resulted in a little bit of friction uh, which was debriefed and lessons were identified from that and we now have better processes for that particular um tank farm um, in terms of emergency services coming in, and they are doing a lot of work together. So yes, expand that family is not just the emergency services, it is anybody who could be involved in the response to an incident, which might also include your local community. Thank you, interesting thought. A question I'd like to pose to each of you, um, sort of round, round the table, as it, the virtual table it was, if you could choose one thing, just one, what would you recommend that we could do to improve our learning? Let's start with you, Thais. <laughs> that, that is a very, very good question. Um, because, because there's a wide range of things you can do, but, but, but I'll, I'll tell you my, my, my one thing, and that's, that's around culture. Um, it, it, it's about, about being open on, on, on the small things that, um, that go wrong. Each, each big incident in, in the world has had several precursors where we could have uh, start, start learning and say, hey, we need, we need to do a better job, we need to avoid this. Um, typically, if you, if you tell an employee uh, um, uh, only one time in his life that he did do sh something stupid, uh, the, the, the next 30 years he will not tell you uh, anything stupid he did. Um, because because he, he feels he's, he's punished for that and his boss uh, isn't, one of, isn't interested. And that's your learning opportunity that you screw up for the next 30 years. Uh, um, things start going wrong by somebody doing something stupid. And um, if, if you don't feel that that's a great learning moment, 
moment, um, but 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 like to, to punish the guy for 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 that, you're 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 lost forever, and you only start learning when um, and we had your big blast and and, and kill fifteen people, um, which which is rather rather late. Um, the, the the other thing is also that um, learning from the incident, from the bigger incidents, is is being um, a, a drawback is is culture. It's it's culture driven also by society that does not accept um, incidents from 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 companies, um, and and that is why companies become very very shy in sharing uh, uh, about their learnings. Um, I, I just spoke to uh, a company in in, in Germany uh, um, uh, which had two years ago a, a big fire on their site. Uh, nobody died, but uh, they say, hey, there's there's nothing we are going to tell about this because of the uh, legal case that is that is connected. Two years, nobody is able to learn from 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 the biggest fire uh, um, uh, because of legal cases because of um, uh, 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 the legal society that we put on on there and that's part of the culture which which is not good uh, legal also drives us to um, to say nothing and and not to to, to create an open learning uh, uh, culture um, and um, it's it's not about money anymore. It, we, we we really should overcome that at legal. Um, we should should overcome our pride at at the managers uh, that 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 need to just be more open. And um, and of course we need to create an open culture where small things go miss. Uh, we feel those are learning opportunities, and not any more reasons to uh, to to punish somebody. Thank you, Nigel. What is your one thing we should do? Um, I'll perhaps be a little bit boring and say actually I totally agree with, with, with what Tyson said about about culture and it ties into what Carl was saying earlier about how you bring together operators and emergency services together and, and talk more with um, with outside organizations one thing that insurers we always look for when we go on for a site particularly with emergency response you know, how many times do you get the external brigades in? How many times do you talk them through your plans? Do you show them round? Do you, do you get people together? So there is that culture always of, of learning. And that extends um, for, for inside an operation, for, look, for uh, taking seriously things like um, uh, near misses, unsafe incidents, and trying to always look for where can I learn internally from things that could have go wrong? And where can I look also externally for for other providers you know things like this conference are an excellent facility for people to say yeah we've had something like that you know and and sharing those kind of experiences maureen do you have one particular thing do you think people should do to improve their learning yeah it's a take a little bit on previous speakers but of course we're always going to say something similar i think but i think it though there has to be a decision to learn and that's um and there has to be a way to make it actionable. I mean, it's it's nice to say we're going to talk about things, but then things slide. And I think a proactive organization would be one uh, that set that that checks every month whether there was something they should have been learning if they hadn't been paying attention. I mean, you have to have sort of a a schedule of learning almost, and say and say to yourself and say to yourself as a manager or, or as an organization. And of course, it has to be throughout the organization so it has to be an attitude of what have I learned lately because there's always something to learn so if you rushing and doing your business and 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 you said yeah we got to fix that and oh that didn't work out so well we'll get back to that later you have to always have a scheduled later when you get back to it and and that means that you make a regular habit uh, as a as in, in your role as a safety manager as a as a as a site manager as a business product manager whatever at, even as an op as an operator to get to 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 take the time out and know when six weeks have slipped by and you haven't noticed something's going wrong and you haven't thought about it to do that you have to make an active decision to learn and of course then you builds on the sharing and everything else and that makes that gives you an opportunity to employ um, a deeper thought process than just eh, it broke and those and and you have to make the time for that okay Thank you. And it sounds as though this means it needs to be a decision made at the top of the organization that it will be a learning organization. Um, Carl, what and, would your... And the one... people that you hire. 
Okay, uh, Carl, what would your recommendation be? Watch one thing. Um, so, I I mean, I would have probably said culture, <laughs> the same as everybody. Um, but I, I, I suppose the other thing I would look at is, is how we learn. Um, so, for example, the, we, we generally do what we call single loop learning, which is where um, we, we take our result of what we actually got and then we just look back at what our strategies and techniques are and we just try to improve uh, the things that we do. But actually, what we should be doing is double loop learning where we, in fact, look at why do we do what we do. So rather than just looking at what it is we do, we try to do, if I can put it this way, we try to do better things rather than doing things better. So it's a, it's a whole look. It, it's going, it's looking further back in the process. So why are we actually doing that in the first place? Is there a better way to do it? And that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, currently, and it's not a secret, in we, we have the COVID-19 pandemic, and this has had an impact on training, on exercises, on, um, on the way organizations function. And I suspect it's had an impact on um, the way learning has happened within organizations. So what do you think we're going to have to look at once people get into a post-COVID-19 situation, go back in, what, what will have changed and what will have been lost or forgotten that we're going to have to address again? Um, any thoughts, Nigel? What we've seen in the insurance community is that the biggest um, impact of COVID-19 has been firstly on operations numbers uh, and also on the degree to which people have been able to carry out their maintenance and inspection requirements. Now, um, training is obviously a big part of operations organizations. What we have seen is people moving away from, um, from classroom training uh, to e-learning. Although we tended to find actually that training has still been going on at the sort of frequencies that they normally would be going on. So I think what's going to happen once we're all you know, uh, back to normal is that people taking an opportunity to go back to um, doing actual um, either outside training, if it's say emergency response training, going back to rolling out hoses and discussing events as a group rather than doing theoretical training. I think that's what we're going to see. I think we'll see a, a a glut of people going back into classrooms um, and and getting more training in that way. Mm -hmm. Carl, do you have any thoughts on how our training might change post COVID? Yeah, I think probably it's very similar to Nigel. I think we we have to be careful, um, and I certainly know in the organisations I work with, um, there's there's almost a a pull of trying to get people back into work in the UK from sort of like May June time. Um, which will kind of do away with some of the skill sets we've built up on these systems. And I think it goes back to that thing I was saying earlier about we have to look at every opportunity. If we don't do a training day because we can't get somebody in a classroom, what's wrong with this platform? You know, we need to exploit all of those opportunities and see, yes, it's very difficult to teach somebody to fight a tank fire online. <laughs> That's, you know, but there's, there's not to say we can't undertake some training or some information exchange online prior to actually getting people together. So I think we do have to look at what we've learned in terms of our our levels of use and understanding of online platforms and what actually can be achieved. Uh, and we need to hold those and, and make sure that we don't let that skill uh, decay. Mm -hmm. in, Maureen, in, you work with inspectors and government officials in, um, in another part of your, your field of work, and, and they're involved also in the learning process. It's not just the operators. In, do you have any thoughts on how post-COVID or the, what we've learned during the COVID pandemic can impact the opportunities for learning, particularly with your group of colleagues? Well, I think... Uh... A lot of the, there are a couple issues. One is, um, but they all come back to staff, people, people, people. That people are an integral part of the safety. And um, we still, you know, have worries about um, the, the IT, cybersecurity, et cetera. But 
you know, in the past five years, there's been a lot of discussion about everything being automated. I think we're going to recheck those the, the the predictions pretty carefully now because there's just so much more that is people based than IT based still in safety and probably always will be because it requires judgment in context not to and and so because of that I think there will be I hope that there are for example new strategies in industry to manage people changes because they've had a steep learning curve and from what I can tell they've done really really well so hopefully that will carry over to safety in future. The other uh, issue, thing that we did, did see was that, that you, can, you can do a lot uh, inspection-wise remotely and make an inspection more efficient by doing your documentation checks, et cetera. But you can't do away with the physical inspection. And um, so I felt like it put, put closure on some ideas that were floated around about because we've been all IT and automation crazy for the last five years and now we know probably um, that it's always going to be a balance and that people are probably never going to leave the equation and they're probably going to still dominate for the most part for the foreseeable future. Okay. And Thais, how do you think the world will change post-COVID in the learning field? Yeah, this, this this is an interesting one. Um, I, I, I got connected to somebody who shared me the uh, pre-COVID um, budget of, of Shell people traveling around the world. And he mentioned a number there and he said, that is never going to get back. So um, so that budget, uh, which which is now proven that, that with a with a tenth uh, of, of the budget, you can you can still stay alive. So um, so so the traveling and, and, and the electronic connectivity um, is it will will stay different. Um, I, I like the, the the thought a little bit huh, on, on, on training. There, there's a little bit of difference between uh, sharing information and, and and truly training. I think with this all these digital tools, we have been uh, well keeping up sharing information, and and that can be low cost very quickly. Um, had and that 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 is a thing which is wonderful uh, because we were forced into it um truly learning has something to do also with um with the intensity uh, that you experience thing with the intensity of, of of meeting people um and and i feel that is where where we have stopped uh, doing doing things a little bit um, uh, uh, truly uh, learning you, you you need to face to face and uh, you will see that that a conference as today where we can share very well information but as soon as we can meet face to face again we are going to do that because the intensity uh, that that we will will learn and and, and really establish the things is um, is more intense and, and more valuable in in face to face. So I hope a lot of it is um, is is coming back uh, this, despite the fact that uh, that travel budgets um, will 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 be reduced. <laughs> So it will hopefully improve, but it's going to be different. In perhaps a controversial question: Are we learning? Do we do we keep just repeating the same accidents? In do we just have new versions of old things? And hey, Nigel, what is your view? You're on mute. Sorry. You, you can probably guess what I'm going to say. Let me give you an example uh, of a loss back in 1999 at a refinery tank farm. Uh, an 80,000 barrel gasoline tank overflowed as part of a filling operation. Um, vapor cloud formed that ignited to give a vapor cloud explosion and a subsequent fire. Five of the nine storage tanks in the area were destroyed and the fire took two days to extinguish. Now, it was a case of the wrong tank was being filled. The filling was being left unattended. No volume checks were being done. The um, high-level alarm on the tank was ignored. There was no functioning independent high-level alarm or overfill protection trip. And as a result of this incident, four operators were actually arrested for carelessness. There were seven casualties and losses of around 50 million US dollars. That was in 1999. Six years later, in 2005, the UK suffered a similar loss. Tank overfilling, vapor cloud explosion, fire, multiple tank damage. 
The UK loss was very widely publicised, not just in the UK, but worldwide, and is the subject of countless conference papers, safety bulletins and presentations on incident root causes. So did we learn from that one? Well, four years later, in October 2009, a refinery in Puerto Rico suffered a loss during a gasoline offloading operation from a ship onto the, the onshore tank farm. A 120,000 barrel gasoline tank overflowed. The subsequent VCE ignited. You've got a VCE, a fire, damaged 17 of the 48 petroleum storage tanks. The Chemical Safety Board report um, looked at the root causes, including poor measurement and tank gauging, inadequate tank filling procedures, no independent high level alarm, or no independent automatic overfill protection. Three very similar losses over the space of 10 years. So I think the evidence is that the industry is not effectively learning from losses. And we are getting the same ones reoccurring as we saw from um, Mr. Kletz earlier. And that's just, you know, that's one example which included you know, a very, very high profile example from which we, we are still not learning. Maureen, does your assessment, your analysis confirm what right, Nigel's telling us of the insurance industry is experiencing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can probably, uh, I mean, just think. Chevron, uh, I'll go back to my first headline. Chevron just um, dumped 600 million liters into the San Francisco Bay about six weeks ago is that really that hard to avoid i mean i can i can do what um nigel did too i can name some accident not not to let him like showing up nigel but i know exactly what he's talking about that happened i, I can name a couple of accidents where that happened and it's very similar to what to he, what, what nigel said but there's also the wrong mixtures i almost laughed when i see that because i keep thinking that's the one thing you're supposed to get right when you deliver something is put it in the right tank it, it boggles my mind that that doesn't happen um okay. but also the other point of it is that we also have to look at and this is a different problem is our smaller sites and they have i think a different issue it's hard i think to manage knowledge if you're not a a, a huge company and also the people change all the time and i mean the people uh, in, in the company may change and then the comp and the companies may not have networks that they talk to each other for. We have sometimes really small, small sites where they're a family business. And I think it's it's about it, it's it's difficult to necessarily get a knowledge management culture there like like the uh, big into multinational industries do. So the funny thing is is I really understand how ch a that it's a big challenge and it's hard to overcome in our small and medium um, industries, or sites. But I don't understand why the industries can't figure this out so much. So that's kind of thank my you, take you. on it. A challenge to ties. The EPSC is mainly larger operating companies, mainly. You have a lot of knowledge amongst your members. And the small, medium-sized enterprises are often the customers or the providers of specialities or um, service providers to your members. How can we bridge this knowledge gap? Yeah, Mark, thank you for asking that. Um, and, and, and it's right, we are a member-driven organization and, and we have uh, uh, largely focused on, on, on the large chemical um, sites in, um, in, in, in Europe. While there isn't a, a thing across across the complete chain uh, from the people who bring your chemicals on your site, from from the people that use them, um, and 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 how and and everybody who has that uh, those chemicals in their hand have have probably the same the same problem. So how can we we better benefit um, from from EPSC knowledge in 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 the broader sense? Um, and and uh, I'm I'm not sure I'm having the the, the full answer for for that because um, indeed we're focusing too much um, on on the on the the, the the hazards from from these large chemical sites and, and and how do we manage that on on our sites? 
Um, there are a couple of things that um, that they were doing, and, and and two of the initiatives I've I've showed you at least uh, at the learning sheets um, on on typical incidents. And and in the last five years, we've published fifty of those. Uh, um, if you if you take one a month, there there's really really a lot you can learn uh, uh, from 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 those. The the process safety fundamentals is is something which I feel are the true things that where where, where things go wrong. Um, and, and and everybody can 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 learn from from that set which is um, open and available uh, uh, for use. Um, the, the the typical output of our working groups we had we had two recent working groups uh, um, uh, one on, on semi quantitative risk analysis which is the LOPA performances and risk matrices that we benchmark, and the other one was human performance um, where we say hey. We see that 60 in percent of the incidents is, is caused by a single person that that makes an error leading to um, to the, the release of a chemical. Um, how can we help that person not making that that error? And and a large list uh, um, of of input slides was uh, was was given by um, by our people. Um, uh, generally, we we are pretty open in um, in, in sharing these uh, with us. So we we, we typically have a, a presentation um, that we share with uh, whoever wants to join um in a webinar and um and then we we uh, make make available also the the, the slides packets of uh, of that so um so for the human human error um uh, in in process safety that that webinar was recorded and, and still available and, and there are some slides uh, slides available so um so so we try to help uh, uh, people through the um, through the network um to, to to stay connected and and looking on the epc website might help um linkedin is a thing where we where we share um so, so people can connect uh, freely to linkedin where at least the learning sheets and, and whatever we produce um whatever webinar we, uh, we we try to involve them um, in, in, in a broader audience. And if you see something which is relevant for your site, uh, despite the fact that you are smaller, um, a, a smaller producer, um, there there is good good aspects to to, to learn and, um, and and to stay connected um, without without being a member. Okay, thank you very much. We're Coming up to the end of our session, that ends in two minutes, I would like to finish up by thanking our speakers, our members of the panel, and try and sort of formulate sort of a, a few sort of summarizing words. I think one thing we have to do is to learn, to want to learn, that we need to develop a culture where we talk about failure, but not about the people who had the failures, we need to share, we need to work together, we need to talk about how to share information, how to um, support each other in the different roles that we have, and to learn better, and to, to never believe that learning has stopped. It's a continual process that we have to keep working at it, we have to keep revisiting the things that have happened in the past, looking back to look forward and I hope that all of our attendees at this um, seminar have benefited from listening to our presenters. I wish you all a, um, a very happy sort of time within the rest of the um, conference, but I also wish you a safe time in operating your facilities and I hope that you don't have to phone Nigel to ask for him to regulate your claims, but you're perhaps asking for advice as to how to reduce your uh, limits. That Carl is there for advice, but he's not putting out your fires. And share information with Thais and, and Maureen because we need to talk to each other and share. In It's a mutual uh, journey that we share together. So thank you very much.